Hi everyone, welcome to the Stage Left podcast. Uh, what a privilege it was to record this episode um, to tell the story of the bad seed, uh, George of Jessica. Um, George and I really clicked on so many musical influences. Um, we actually spent three hours um, at George's place uh, discussing music. Um, this was the best hour of it. Um, if you are a Nick Cave fan, um, I'm sure you'll love this. Um, if you're a Stone Roses fan, uh, you're going to learn so much about uh, working with John Squire. Uh, and if you're a music fan in general, you're going to get loads of insight into what a career in music is really like. Um, thanks for feedback on the most recent episode with uh, Milton McDonald of Jeff Lynne's ELO. Um, I forgot to thank uh, Milton for allowing me to play his beautiful white Fender uh, that he has uh, since played on stage um, whilst paying tribute to Chuck Berry uh, at um, ELO's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction last week in Brooklyn. Um, ELO were inducted alongside Tupac and uh, Pearl Jam uh, as well as many others. Uh, that was such a thrill. Uh, thank you, Milton, um, for letting me play on that guitar. And, and bless bless you, you even uh, took a photo uh, on, on my phone, uh, which you can see uh, on the Stage Left Podcast Instagram page. Um, for new listeners, please subscribe on iTunes, write reviews, uh, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and uh, Instagram. Um, at the Stage Left Podcast.com, you'll, you can hear episodes with um, the likes of uh, keyboardist Mike Farrell uh, on writing songs and touring with Morrissey, uh, legendary uh, producer Tony Visconti on recording Black star with David Burry um, and playing uh, with Mark Bolan of T-Rex um, and Sam Hurley he um, giving an emotional first interview in a decade uh, about the roller coaster ride uh, that was the cult British band uh, Hope of the States um, we do this for love we do it for free uh, to provide educational content guidance and wisdom to young musicians and to tell the stories that deserve to be told of the unsung heroes behind the success uh, we're always looking for extra help so um, please get in touch if you can spare a couple of hours uh, once per month um, we're a team based globally now doing various roles um, if you've noticed a marked improvement in the detailed episode descriptions uh, that's because listener Andrew Velzian got in touch and offered to help out uh, he's far better at, uh, at that than I am um, and he listens to the show now and, and writes those in advance um, and John Meredith uh, was a regular listener who is head of a music college in the UK um, and got in touch and now helps with the editing um, I do a couple of jobs away from this so if anyone wants to get in touch it would be great uh, help to me and Andy Phelan who, who runs the YouTube channel um, our next episode episode is with, with, with a member of uh, Guns N' Roses. Um, so if you want to get involved, uh, drop us a line via the stageleftpodcast.com. Um, sometimes some of our amazing and kind listeners donate uh, to buy as a coffee on our website, which is really lovely. Uh, it always amazes me to see those kind of messages and kind words in the email inbox. Uh, on this occasion, I would suggest instead spending a few quid uh, on seeing the new Nick Cave documentary uh, film One More Time with Feeling. It will change your life. Uh, it certainly has mine. So here we go, the story of another unsung hero in the music industry, George Vajestica. Because nothing really matters We follow the lines in the palms of our hands You're standing in the supermarket Nothing Okay, welcome to the Stage Left Podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. Today's guest is an unsung hero in the music industry, uh, a current member of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, George Vajestica. Um, George is uh, not only a bad seed, but he's also a man who's recorded in the studio and toured with John Squire, The Stone Roses, um, worked for four years on two albums with Groove Armada, uh, and also currently plays in the coolest band around at the moment, Bandante. Today we'll be finding out uh, what makes Nick Cave unique, um, how the experience of playing The Bad Seeds contrasts and compares to writing with uh, Groove Armada, uh, the recording process behind uh, the album Skeleton Tree and, and filming of One More Time with Feeling, um, how Bandante uh, approach making every gig individual, uh, and we'll find out what it's like playing some of the iconic Stone Roses guitar parts written by John Squire, while Squire himself is stood only a few metres away. Um, so it's a pleasure to say that our guest today on the Stage Left podcast is none other than George of Jessica. Thanks for joining us today, George. How's it Hi, going? Chris. Hi, Chris. It's going good. Good stuff. So you have recently played in Australia and New Zealand, I think, with the Bad Seeds. Mm -hmm. um, Soon to be going on North America tour before some UK dates in Glasgow, Nottingham, Manchester, Bournemouth, and the O2. Then going on to Europe, I believe, as well. After that, um, how does the prospect of touring sit with you these days? Oh, I find it really exciting. Yeah, I I, I love touring. I love going out and um, just going to new places, and it's just something. It's it's an incredible thing to be playing with the Bad Seeds live, and uh, the shows in Australia were were great. Best ones we've done. Uh, best ones I've done. Best ones you've done? Yeah. It, 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 why is that? What, what, what? It just felt um, it was great to go out and play the new album and also 
play some of the old songs, but it's just there was a great feel and um, just a really good vibe around the band and everybody involved. And the shows were re really well received too. With the prospect of going on tours for kind of a couple of months at a time, you've done this for, for many years now. Um, is there anything you kind of dread about going on tours at all, or is it it's all just a big laugh? No, it's not a laugh. It's serious. It's 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 you know it's a serious thing. Um, so I take it really seriously um, from a family point of view. Uh, yeah, I do miss my family, but um, it's just one of those things. It's a small price to pay. Um, you're gearing up for some of these gigs in the UK, and one of them's at the O2, I think, later in the year, and that's quite a large kind of marquee gig, so to say. Um, does the mindset or approach change when playing to 20,000 people instead of uh, a, a couple of thousand? Yeah, I think so. I think you're just, you're just aware of the scale of things. I don't think your performance changes much because um, you're kind of rehearsed and you've got into that space, and you're in a particular space, headspace. So that way, you, um, you're in a zone. But still going out, we played a show in Perth that was a big show. And um, there's a certain feeling, because you can, it, can, it can be quite, it's, it's quite intimidating to go out in front of like, such a big audience. But some, in reality, it's, it's not. Mm. The actual act of doing this, the thought of it can be. But when you actually go out and play, it's, it's not. What do you do with that nervous energy beforehand, or do you not get nervous now? Oh, not really. I, I mean, hate to say it, but I don't. That's, that's, that's good. That's a great place to be. I mean, that's experience, I guess, as well. Um, so there's a new compilation coming out, uh, Lovely Creatures, which is uh, a, a, a compilation of three decades' worth of uh, a Bad Seas material, uh, and a new film uh, has just come out. I watched it last night. Um, how did the finished product of the film turn out com uh, compared to your expectations when you filmed it? Um... um I think the film's amazing. Uh, it's it's a unique take. I love the fact that it came out in 3D. So initially you can see it on 3D. I know the DVD is just a standard format, but um, it was just it added to you know the the whole thing. We're going to discuss uh, working with uh, Nick uh, and the recording of that album in a while. Um, but I'd like to begin with. Um, how does the music industry actually compare from your point of view to what you thought it would be like when you were a young kid growing up in Stoke? Yeah. Is Stoke? Yeah. yeah. So how does it compare in, real, in reality to what you thought it would be? It's, um, well, when you're, when you're 9 and 10 and 11 and you get into music, you're completely, it's a dream. It's like a total dream. And at that time as a kid, I was lucky enough to see, I had two older brothers, so, I, you know, one was into rock music, also like progressive, yep. and another one was into punk. So they kind of influenced what, you know, I had all sorts going on in the house. And at the time, it was great because there's so much music around and bands back in those days, those days would come, you know, would come to Stoke. There's a place called the Hanley Victoria Hall. And another who, place... Who did you see there? Oh, okay. just so many bands looking back on it. Saw The Clash, saw, you know, bands like The Pretenders and all of those kind of bands. You'd see people like... You see rock bands like ACDC. Really? Yeah. yeah wow. We saw those. There was another place called the Trent, Trentham Gardens, which is an amazing venue and beautiful old ballroom. Still open? No, not oh, down. Okay. Tragic, tragic yeah. waste of a, an amazing place. And another place called Bingley Hall, which is an old cow shed right. in Stafford, which actually was like the main stop, stop for bands outside of London right. in the Midlands. It was like sort of in the middle. I think it's taken over by the NEC and those kind of places. Right, right, right. But Bingley was great because... I miss Bowie there, 78, which was like heartbreaking. But um, yeah, you had loads of bands. Um, Floyd played there, uh, Yes, and all those kind of prog bands of that ilk. But then I remember the jam playing there, and who else? Just loads of bands. Who really landed with you then and was then influencing you as a guitar player? Um, first one, without a doubt, was Jimi Hendrix. That's the first thing that you know made me want to play the guitar. But then from there, there was loads of, loads of people like... I had a mix because it was like I had the Floyd thing with people like uh, David Gilmore and Peter Green, so that kind of bluesy side nice. of players. And then you have the sort of more the punk the punk players, obviously like the Pistols. I love the energy of that. So Steve Jones would have been a good one. Townsend from the Who, and then I found 
you know, as it sort of turned into the post punk thing, you start to you know discover new guitar players, different players, and it all led to some. You know, it was a, a, like you know stepping stone to another yeah. type of music, and so yeah. You know, and I later on, you were to, you were to cross paths with something because you, you play with a couple of members of the stage. Is that right? I did. Did you share the stage with them? Is that right? I did, I did, which was amazing. A friend of mine who I used to play in a band with, he called me to say, "Do you want to play with uh, Glenn Matlock and Paul Cook nice. on New Year's Eve and do a, a version of Submission?" And it was like, "Got to do it." Yeah, you have to. And was it just that, just for one song or? It was one song, yeah, just got up there and it was just mad. And then it was like, it was, uh, it was, you know, five to 12. Oh, and wow. And then it was New Year and, you know, you're clocking Paul Cook. Yeah. And you're thinking, Jesus, tonight I am Steve Jones. <laughs> mentioned you missed Bowie and mm. Bowie was a big influence for you I think Number I saw one. that you, you, you had the same guitar he had is that right? That's my mum bought me a guitar from a catalogue and and I remember the day it arrived and it you know it came in this box and she played like instalments oh um, bless her. yeah yeah so sweet it was my dad he bought me a guitar first bought me a nylon string guitar when I was nine and that was after the Hendrix thing seen that and then my mum got me a guitar from, uh, yeah, from the catalogue and paid monthly instalments. Oh, wow. <laughs> Mad, really sweet. And then a neighbour had this Hagstrom, Hagstrom Futurama and it was the Bowie guitar. And he was a big Bowie fan. And it wasn't actually, yeah, it was, no, it was, a, was it a neighbour? I can't remember. Somebody around, you know, and it was the Bowie guitar from Rebel Rebel. It wasn't his actual yeah, guitar. Yeah, yeah, it was that guitar. Oh, wow. And that was the one I really learned how to play on the guitar. I played it every day. And I was just, you know, I loved Bowie as a kid. Just absolutely loved him. And uh, massive, massive. But having that guitar was it. That was the one where I really got me act together on. When you were playing those songs and, and learning those songs, I'm guessing it was a lot of Bowie songs you learned to play, mm -hmm. I guess, right? Um, Looking back, what do you think the young George Majestica was trying to accomplish? He's trying to be David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> but you wanted to, is it something you, wanted, you obviously wanted to do as a career or did yeah, you? Definitely, yeah, definitely, no. Yeah, yeah totally. It totally. wasn't for fun, it was something that you took very seriously. No, it was, it was almost the second I saw Hendrix on TV, I remember seeing it, I just thought that was it. And then I remember asking, like, you know, my brothers about Jimi Hendrix and blah, 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 and I think he got hold of, like, Electric Ladyland, and it was just what is this kind of out of space? It is out of space, yeah. and it was like, what is this thing? It was a, a, just a complete door opening, you know. For me, it was just that was it. And so, I'm guessing you were in, uh, you, you played in a lot of bands in your teens and that kind of thing. And Did school bands and and stuff like that. Played in like bands and had little bands that never got anywhere. We never tried to get out. We were always like messing about in a garage somewhere. But it really was, it was like, it was, you know, just having a go and playing. I've got a quote from you here. Mm. Um, you, you kind of just referenced it there, but I saw so many amazing bands uh, during the late 70s and early 80s, but still, even then, I knew I had to leave. Yeah. Why? Because I felt, I, well, Part of in truth is that my parents um, met in Manchester, but they both came from Croatia, the Serbian faith, and you know, but actually met in Manchester. And there was something about I didn't really feel I didn't feel like I fit, I fit in. I fitted in there. I just felt, and at that time, I just remember thinking like we used to go to Manchester a lot. I had family there. And we used to go to gigs there, and Manchester was like a bit more had a bit more going on than Stoke did. But by the time I hit 14, it was just like London, I wanted to do it. And, you know, the first opportunity, real opportunity I got to go, to come down to London, I just went for it, did it. What was that opportunity? 
Um, was it through I, music? Well, I was work. I had a job. I worked in a radio station and got sacked. <laughs> what for? I just been quite upfront with people. I think I do know why, but it was just it, it served its purpose and it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I just felt like I was. I thought it was an in to get into the music business, and it wasn't. Was there pressure from your family not to move to London and not no. to pursue it? They were happy for you to yeah. follow that, yeah? Mm -mm. Not happy because, like, you know, parents, you know, they were, they, I've, I'll give it to me, parents. They actually let me be who I wanted to be. And they didn't put any kind of restrictions on me in any way. And they were totally, you know, caring and loving parents. And they didn't have a lot. And um, they'd had a tough time. You know, they came to England you know, separately, like say, met in Manchester. Mm. And, you know, we just ended up working in, in a tyre factory, you know. And, um, and that was the thing to do. You got a job, you either got yourself an apprenticeship or you got yourself, you know, uh, went to university or studied. And I, you know, completely did not want to do that. I left school at 16. Mm. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to work. And I tried that out. And as in, I didn't want to work as in get an apprenticeship, although I did, you know, just, you, I remember going for interviews and it just wasn't me. It just didn't happen. And then, yeah, so at like 18, it was like starting to, like, that's it, get out of here. And then you spend a few years trying to get your act together in London because it's so different. Mm. And it's quite, um, for such a big place, it's, you can live a very isolated life because you're trying to make friends and meet people and, and work it all out. And it's so different from, um, at the time from what Stoke was about. But I think just that thing about... Um, I've got it in my blood. I think it comes from my parents. There's this kind of gypsy side. It's not a gypsy in the sense of being a gypsy, but a traveller. You know, and moving and being, um, what's the word? Transient. But, you know, just sort of like, um, there's a great word to describe this and it's completely gone. What is you, it? You, you say that you, um, so you, your parents are both from Serbia, is that right? No, Croatia. Croatia. Croatia Serbian faith. Oh, right, so yeah. Croatia and Serbian faith. Mm. Um, you speak fondly of Manchester, you moved to mm. London at a young age, obviously you speak of uh, Stoke. Where is home? So if you were to describe home as one place, where would it be? Uh, it's London. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because this is where I am, you know, this is where everything I've done in terms of, like, career-wise, it all stems from being here. And so I think that's what it is. Coming back to your question, is that thing of... Um, the ironic thing was, when I did leave, a few few years later, in Manchester, it all kicked off. All yeah, started, yeah. All, it, all, all of that happened. Yeah, of course. But I'd been down here for a few years and sort of, like, was, in, was around, so you sort of got your feet under the table a bit. But it really did kick off in Manchester. Mm. And it was like, do you go up there? But I, had not, I didn't really have anything. The irony was that years later, I go back, you know, in the mid-30s, and I'm working with John Squire. John Squire, wow. You know, that, that, was the, that, was the, that was the kind of, such an irony. <laughs> particular, the actual guitar rock side of things, alternative rock side of things, it was more of a kind of provinces thing. Mm. London back in, in, in the 80s, yeah. there was a kind of, there was in the sort of like, there was a kind of goth side going on, mm -hmm. it was, but also, and yeah, but there was, a, it wasn't really, that's what's so exciting about what happened at the end of, with bands like the Stone Roses. It exploded. Yeah. It it was a, in. I'm sure it was like the whole kind of e thing that kicked in, and yeah. all of that kind of f football hooligan that suddenly is coming up mm. and hugging you. It was a, it was a, a social shift, and I think you know Manchester was a great place for it to happen in. It was ready because you had the hacienda, you had like New Order, they had that, you know, and there's it that whole kind of electronic thing that came over from the states, and they really really were on top of that. 
and that you know we used to go up to the hacienda we drive up from here and then end up in port port like port Marion. right <sighs> crazy times but um it was great fondest memory of those those evenings in uh, hacienda one night with a guy called calvin who's the singer of a a, 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 they're like a seminal punk band from Stoke called Discharge right and um, he was literally hanging off the balcony and mm. it was funny mad Perf- was he performing there? he wasn't <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't no he was great he was great and um, yeah it was just that's the thing you could have a, a thing like you know I think that's when it all started all those kind of separate Boxes that music was kind of boxed in. You had punk. I mean, you're talking about like, you know, think about Calvin, like Discharge. You were like mm. a hardcore yeah. GBH Discharge. They were like yeah. a hardcore punk band. Yet he was like hanging out at the Hacienda. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we were going out there. And so that kind of like blew it all open. I think that was, the, in a way, the start of it all becoming more, you know, open. Because yeah. pe- before that, you know, you had. It was very, in particular, Jean, you know. Yeah, particularly Jean, yeah. Um, so you spoke about. John Squire, yeah, bit of a hero of mine. Mm-hmm. So there's, a, there's a, obviously a big gap here between you going to the Hacienda, you know, travelling up there from London to yeah. actually playing playing with John. So you would have played uh, with John Squire about uh, early two thousands. Um, how did that come about? Did he approach you? Had, had you made a name for yourself? No, I knew his, I knew his wife, right. and um, I was in a band in the nineties, and we had a big record deal and all that kind of stuff, and it all went wrong. And she was. Um, one of the guys was in the band which she was friends with and we all sort of knew each other and then you know sort of like you just lose track of people and people move away and then I got a call not from John's wife but from this guy I was in the band with saying like um, you know Sophie John's wife has been in touch and you know he needs a guitar player he's doing his solo thing this was post the Seahorses yeah and he needs a guitarist uh, you know, so expect a call from John. And actually, what it was, I was up, I was visiting my parents up in Stoke, and um, I was driving down. I was driving back, and uh, phone <laughs> the phone goes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Pulled over. I kept it safe, and it was John, and he was like, "Hi, it's John Squire, and uh, I'm looking for a guitarist. Can you tell me something about yourself?" <laughs> And what did you say? <laughs> I don't know. I can't well, remember. how did you sell it to? It? So, so why, why, why you over anybody else who, who was about? That's an incredible gig to get. You know, obviously, it was you must great. have made a very good name for yourself as a as a technically. The thing is, I didn't make a name for myself. I was just known by certain people. It wasn't like I was known in the business as being this shit up guitarist that you know. And I didn't never saw myself like that. It's just that um, people who knew me knew what I you know knew what I was about. And then, and Sophie just suggested. I think it's, it's that, that, there's a thing about the right character in the band as well. Sometimes yes. people you can work with. It's not just about being an amazing musician and like being able to do this stuff. There's a, there's a lot more that goes on. Mm. That whole thing about how it works with people, chemistry, and, and you know, sort of how you connect with people. That's really interesting because one of the questions I was going to say about working with um, John when you toured is that you played a lot of Stone Roses songs. And Stone Roses had this kind of real kind of gang mentality about Definitely. them, like. Did he try and recreate that, or was that something no. that you tried? But maybe he did try and recreate it by who he, before you'd even um, started playing with him, by trying to get the right people. Is that? It? Did, I think. Kept... I think what it was, John was just wanted to do his own thing. Post the series, he had some great songs. They were slightly different. The start, yeah. and, and you know, he was maturing as an artist as well, and he was becoming more. He was writing music that and that was kind of suited where he was at at the time, and. So it was, it was definitely more of a solo thing, but he just needed musicians to be able to sort of, you know, play live. And um, would you remember? The, did you have to audition, or was it just? I went up. I drove up the day after. I drove back up north. I remember getting back to London, thinking, right, I've got to go back up, and I didn't actually take a guitar. <laughs> I thought, you know, if anyone's got a guitar, yeah. he, he's going to have one. I didn't take a guitar, and I got up to his place, in, which is just outside of um, Macclesfield, and he. He, he was like, where's your guitar? I was like, I've got one. Oh, man. And we played a song, and, and it just, it kind of, it, there was something there. But he said, okay, you know, straight away, you're in. But I had like, I think it was 10 days before we did the first show. 
Wow. And they'd had a guitar player in for a month and it just hadn't worked out with them. So, you know, they'd been playing. There was a, there was a keyboard player and a drummer and a bassist and John and another guitar player and it just didn't work out. So he said, can you go back down? You know, yeah, can you do it? So I came back. So literally we had about a week to get it together. And it was a big deal for John, I think. I think the thing was, for him, it was the first time he was actually going out and fronting a band and singing. Yeah. And that was something that, you know, he's really sticking his neck out doing that. And, you know. What was your role? Because he, I mean, he's an amazing guitarist, but yeah. we're watching some of the videos, which are still up on, on YouTube. I checked them out. Like, you're sharing a lot of the role, uh, the, the parts with him. How, how did that conversation go down? Well, th the thing was, he wanted, um, he d you know, he's looking for somebody who could play the guitar, but he's such a unique, he's, he's got a really unique style, John has. I remember his, his guitar tech, Martin, saying that uh, John's not like a normal guitar player. And there's something about the way he plays. He sort of, he's, he's, he's got a, a bit of the old um, Django's going right. on. His fingering, the way he plays the guitar. And he's, he, he's got just a very unusual, he's not a typical guitar player in a sense. He's an amazing guitarist. He's, an ama he's just a really great writer, John. Yeah, yeah. But he's definitely... Um, one of the sort of like it wasn't I, when I asked him it's, how would you play Fool's Gold I didn't want to sort of attack I just thought show us come on show me how you played it and he showed me and it's just the way he played it he's got this weird style and I think that's what makes it so great and, and he's not a jammer well he wasn't at the time but then he would go off and come back and then the next day present like the most amazing guitar solo and he rarely made mistakes and I was kind of fucking up left right and centre <laughs> trying to get it right because the pressure was on yeah, in I mean, many yeah, ways hot, hot, and, and they are particular you know you had guitars tuned in particular tunings and all this kind of stuff and I think that he was feeling a bit of heat just the fact that you know he was out there fronting the a band we had a week to get it together and but it did it all came together great it was a it was a really good band and you know after the, literally from after the first the rehearsals were a bit kind of tense and there was so much to learn for me there was so i was staying up in this kind of shit little b and b in macclesfield and just spending all night trying to learn and work out these like Parts. So you're working out. So he didn't guide you through all of them because we, we actually had a guy called I don't know if you know Aziz Ibrahim who yeah. uh, he, he played guitar um, in the Stone Roses when John left. Mm -hmm. And when he was trying to learn, say uh, Waterfall, yeah, uh, he couldn't work out um, exactly. He didn't realise there was a capo on it and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. He, he, so he plays it in a really really difficult way when yeah, there's actually yeah. a capo on. Yeah. Um, so how were you were you listening to it off the record? Or? Yeah. And the thing was, John didn't say anything about look, it's in an open E and with a capo on on the fifth fret. It was stuff that kind of thing. He yeah. didn't say that. So you're working on you you've got your fingers everywhere, stretching it, and you think. And actually, wow. that was my naivety at the time. In truth, if I just sort of sat back, took a deep breath, and gone, okay, what is going on here? You would have worked it out like that. But because of the you're in that moment and the pressure's on, you're not really sort of thinking straight. So you're playing it in a in a kind of, not the right way. <laughs> Initially, when, I, when, I, when it, for the recording of Marshall's house, it was quite relaxed. Before that, playing those parts, the, the Roses stuff, mm. you've, uh, you, you would be quite intimidating. It's quite a thing because he's such a he's such a particular guitar player, and he's got a particular sound and style and a way of playing that trying to do what he does, it's you just can't do. It's it's a, it's, a, it's very unique to him. 
So at times, when it was playing some of those old songs, the, the Roses stuff, it, it wasn't that it was intimidating, but you felt slightly self-conscious. I wondered, as a, as a Roses fan, you know, a lot of people who are Roses fans would have probably gone to see John Squire to see him play a lot of those guitar parts. I know he played on some of them, but you, you mm. played them as well. Mm. Did you kind of feel the eyes of the Roses fans on totally. your fingers? Really? Yeah, you do. You, you do. You do. There's, the thing is that the Roses have got that kind of fan base. They've got this kind of unbelievably loyal and, and fanatical, um, you know, fans and... and, and you feel that thing of, of the mean so much that those songs to their fans. It's a very English thing, but it was interesting in Japan playing with John because, like you know, it's amazing how music travels and how who it connects with and all through all like creeds and cultures and everything. Because the roses were massive out there. Yeah. And John, we played out. We did a tour of Japan where. It was the first time that John had played the Rosie songs. So he was presenting them in a slightly different way. Um, and it was kind of, you know, songs like Waterfall, it's such a, that's such an amazing, beautiful, it's almost like an English folk song. It's yeah. a gorgeous song. And that was a real treat to play that. You know, John played the main riff, played did that, and I just put these kind of little harmonics in the background, just so. And then just put this kind of wah phase at the end of it that kind of just sat in. It wasn't doing what John was doing. It was just trying to just put something else in there. But um, there's certain things where if you... Yeah, some of the... You know, it's, but John, it was better to leave John to play. You know, I just play the backup guitar yeah. in that way. Because that's what people want. They want to hear him playing his riffs and doing his solos, which he's got a certain thing and a particular... Style. Is there any chance you're working with him again? I don't know. I haven't seen John. The last time I saw him was in uh, was at um, the Village Underground when the Roses played a secret gig. There. Really, you were that? You were that? Oh, wow. <laughs> that was the last time I saw John, and it was funny because Jimmy Page was hanging out backstage, and John's a massive. Jimmy yeah, Page of course. Fan. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it was great. It was really sweet to see John. And Jimmy hanging out, like, you know, best of mates. Awesome. <laughs> and, yeah, and I'd met Jimmy Page before, but it was, it was nice to meet him again. Was so like? that was the last time I saw John. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I'd, like, I'd like to see him socially and say hi. You must have had some interesting discussions about Stone Roses then. Um, he famously said, I'll never desecrate the memory of seminal pop group Stone Roses by reforming. Um, and, and they've reformed and they play loads of great gigs now, uh, some of which I, I've, I've been lucky enough to go to. Um, were you surprised when they reformed? And, and did you ever have conversations about that and, and his time in the Roses? Um, we Not really, didn't really talk. I wasn't surprised because, you know, there's got to be reasons why things happen. And they were a tight-knit unit, and there's obviously that fallout that happened between John and Ian. But... Um, um, I thought it was great that they reformed and it gave, gave people the opportunity to see them live and especially with Rennie playing the drums yeah. that's the thing is to get that because in truth you know they went from playing you know quite small shows did a tour I can't remember when it was like the 80s early like mm. not, not early 80s but like around 87, 88 yeah. and then it went from there to, I, remember, I remember seeing them at the ICA he went from the ICA to Ali Pali and then that was a massive leap mm. and then from Ali Pali yeah. to Spike Island yeah wow and it was just like stratospheric yeah and they were the band of the time and 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 then you know Rennie left and the second coming took such a long time to record and maybe some of the momentum and some of that vibe and spirit that was so attractive about the first album because it was a, such a beautiful record and an amazing record mm probably left the band you know bands things people change yeah so i just think it was great that they did reform and and go out there and, and do it and good on them It's a long, 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 long way down. 
So you recorded with um, John Squire as well as, as touring with him. Um, yeah. What was that like in the studio working with him and how did that compare uh, to working with other artists? Um, I did The Marshall's House, did that record with John. And that was, he had, he'd written, it was a, more of a theme, it was kind of concept album, all about Edward Hopper's paintings. And it's quite a smart record in terms of his content. And the songs were really short, sharp, kind of quite New York style, almost like television or somebody like that. They weren't, you know, kind of baggy. No, they weren't. Thing yeah. that I know the record, he's yeah. known for. Yeah. So, and the band was had been playing for about a year at that point, and we went in the studio, and John presented the songs, and we sort of like put our little bits in. So there's little bits of guitar that you know I put in there, but the, the songs were written by John, and um, and everyone contributed in terms of music with little parts. John Ellis on keyboards, he put some really interesting road stuff in there, and and um, Hammond stuff in there, Stan on bass and Luke Bowen on drums. So and it felt quite bandy. It was and Simon Dawson produced it, and he worked. On, I think he worked on the last Roses record. Oh right, okay, yeah. So. That was, it was a very quick record. We recorded that quickly in like three days. But then it took a couple of weeks to mix and da da da. So. That's great. Thanks for talking about that. That's so, that's so interesting. And, and uh, other, other artists you worked with, Groove Armada. Yeah. So a couple of records you appeared on. I've got some songs down here that I listened to. Um, Look Me in the Eye Sister. That's a tune you play on that, is that right? I did. That's on that one. that's a great tune and uh, yeah. McNeil Blacklight I think Soundboy Rock I think you some played on some of these I played on one track on Soundboy Rock and that was just a guy with uh, with a uh, with I can't remember what was his name he was he's quite a good singer and that was quite an interesting song what happened with Groove on Mod was that they wanted to take it into a more of a kind of band alternative kind of direction from their kind of whole music of black origin dance kind of yeah. thing that they were sort of known for. And they had a particular thing. I wasn't a massive fan. And, but they came in and, you know, wanted to take... And at the time, it was like, all right, I'll give it a go. And the album that, you know, I was kind of involved with was the Blacklight album. And that was a different... That was a change of direction. It was a, it was a, there was a different take on what they were trying to do there. What challenges did that throw you up as a guitarist working with musicians from a different genre? Are you used to playing different genres? The thing, that, well, the thing that's different, a lot of it's all on backing track and it's all on click track, and you end up playing parts that are very um, mechanical, mm. and you cut and you in you you end up just playing forty eight bars of you know two notes, and it's got to be nailed, so it's just completely locked in. That's the part that I found. Um, just not my bag. What I found, what, so for me to make it interesting, I'd explore s textures and sonic stuff. And so I, I started to use like, coming back to the capos, to, to mu muso talk here. Mm. I'd start using capos and tunings. Mm. And then you get, I was able to you know, really sort of develop certain things with harmonics and like uh, 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 delays. And, and you were given the freedom to do that. I just did it. Um, right, okay. And if it, if it worked, it was kept. It was definitely their thing. It was their direct... They wanted to do it. But there's a, there, was a, there was an element of, like, let's push it here. And there's another guy called Martin Collins who's playing the drums. So on that record, there was different guest singers and different writers, and Tom and Andy wanted to take it to a certain place, different place. So that's what made it interesting. But um, there's a remix album called... The White Light, which is more... Yeah, went, I heard it. Yeah, which is going... That was more of a kind of remix from the thing. I think they might have got... The, there's some great songs on that record that just didn't um, sort of like... It wasn't recognised. I think there's a lot of other stuff going on, business-wise, that became um, affected the overall thing. Look me in the eyes, sister. Is it an ongoing battle to be a stage left or session musician um, where you essentially have to sometimes do what the singer 
dictates to you and you have this kind of creative outlet naturally within you as an artist and a musician uh, and you have to temper it is it is it an ongoing battle and, and and if so how do you get around that i think yeah i mean it depends who you are if you want to just be like a, a session guitarist i've never seen myself as a session guitar player no. never i never wanted to be that so the thing is, if you respect the musicians you work with and understand, you're getting something from it, you'll learn. And that's mm. that kind of process where you can actually get something from it and it'll take you, it'll open another, you know, avenue. Yeah. It does do that. But also it can be pretty restrictive as well. And there's that other side of being a musician and making money as a musician, being, you know, working. And, and particularly after the groove on my thing, I vowed I'd never do that again. And you're sticking to that? Yeah, totally. Um, film soundtracks. Yeah. You played on a few film soundtracks. Have you written on film soundtracks, or have you just played on songs that are composed by? The I've people? done actually. I've done something that never made the grade, but the the ones the soundtracks that you know, that are no no yeah. noted for it are the ones with Nick, Nick and Warren. And um, working working with them on, on on soundtracks is that a case that um, is, are they pre written songs much like they could appear on albums, or are they extended piece of the music? I think gone? there's a particular way in which Nick and Warren work, and they have a certain um, well, they've got, definitely got a certain chemistry. But there's a certain... It's... The first one I worked on was The Proposition, and, and that was I just came in and played guitar on that one. Yeah. As I did with Lawless, I just yeah, played, Lord. you know, some guitar. It wasn't a case of writing or... Well, there was, an, there was on, 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 on The Proposition, there was this thing that we did at the end where we just jammed for 20 minutes. And um, we just sort of, like, played around... And it was amazing. It was really beautiful. And that was actually used. And I think I, got, I think I did get a credit for that. Did you? Yeah, yeah, I did see that. That's why I asked you got somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I did, yeah. That's excellent. So I watched um, One More Time of Feeling mm. last night. <sighs> Heavy film, man. Great, great, great film, beautiful film. Um, very moving. Um, what you can see watching that film is the importance uh, Warren Ellis plays, um, particularly in that, that record, but obviously um, he's worked with, with Nick for many years and you worked with them when before you actually joined as a full-time member, as you kind of touch upon. Um, tell us about their working relationship. What makes it so effective? And what could, what could other musicians learn from the way they work together? Uh, well, he's just got a great way of collaborating. I think that the thing is, um, Warren, he's, got, he's an amazing musician. He's a fantastic musician, incredible player. And he can, you know, he's very diverse, but he's got a particular thing about sonics and sounds and textures and, and, and just these... He creates these amazing loops that, you know, are just so not in time but have an incredible vibe. And then he will... And then Nick can play over the top of that and then write, you know, lyrically, and then put his ideas and his thoughts down with that. And he just... I think they just got a real chemistry together and there's something that clicks with them. In love, in love. I love you, love, I love you, love, I'll move you, move, and one more time with feeling. I love you, love, I love you, love, I'm sown in half, and all the stars are splashed. Cross the ceiling. There's a very raw, up-close document um, of a period of Nick Cave's life and his creativity um, around the time where uh, Nick Cave um, lost his son in tragic, tragic circumstances um, during the recording process of the album. It's a very, very moving film. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a snapshot of, of, of the confusion. He, he says this uh, of someone trying to make understanding of the world he currently finds himself in. Um, I, my interpretation of some of the songs and, and, the, and the time signatures and the unusual timings was that um, they reflected kind of... Um, 
uh, a disillusionment and um, perhaps something that um, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't quite align and, and, and something isn't quite right. And, and with the offbeats and the, and the unusual timing, that, that's, that's what it came across to me as. Um, we spoke beforehand and you said that they work like that anyway. Is that yeah, right? well, they do. I mean, a lot of the album was recorded before. Yeah. And also, uh, everyone's got their own interpretation. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's, the, you know, that's the great thing about music. You can interpret it, interpret it the way you want to. But um, I just think the way that they work in particular is there's a certain way in which they work. They don't, they're not, it's nothing's kind of standard or locked down. It's very, very open. We never knew where the one was, was a quote by Nick in the film. It's like, we live, you know, and um, yeah, it's just really, really interesting. Just, um, yeah, some of the structure of the songs. I tried to play along to some of them the other day and I just could never tell where the changes were. Yeah. It's like, um, so what do you remember about filming the... Uh, That's the feeling. That's the feeling, all right, there we go. Um, the Magneto itself, um, you recorded that in the round, it's, it's so beautifully shot, and mm. um, was, was, that a, was that a long take, was that a one take thing, or was that something that took? A lot of it was recorded, I mean, there were overdubs done, so there's a, di a different stuff that was done, but um, again, I think it's more a case, of, no, it's, it's kind of, you get a, a backing track done, and then it's played over, Yeah, I thought so. and then, um, you know, there'll be overdubs and stuff, that's the way it's done. Favourite song on the album for me, Skeleton Tree, beautiful song, the, the, the title track from the album. Uh, you playing the opening chords, is that right? I do. The opening all the way through, it's such a beautiful intro. You've got the guitar just, just there, oh, um, nice. that, that, that's, that's an absolute beauty. Um, tell us about that guitar, your relationship with that guitar. And... It's a working guitar, it's a, a Gibson, it's a um, J45, it's a new one. Um, on the film I play this, one of, you know, one of my favourite guitars, uh, uh, Gibson Elvery Brothers, that Funny enough, I picked up in Stockholm when the Bad Seeds played there in 2013, and I'd had my eye out for one of those for years. And and actually, I sort of it, it was like about three months before that I knew it was there. I thought, oh, you know, we're going, <laughs> we're gonna go to Stockholm, and I'm gonna get that guitar. If it's, if it's got, you know, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And it was there three months later, so I got it. But this one in particular, the J45, just a standard one I got from Gibson. And uh, it's a work, you know, it's a workhorse. It's, it's one of those things that you can, don't worry about if it gets broken, sounds good, you play it and, you know, it's just, it does what is required. There's a version of uh, the song on the film, um, midway through the film, that sounds kind of, it's got the vibe of Jesus Alone, it's not got any acoustic guitar on. Um, do you remember there being lots of different versions of that song and where did you come into to the recording, so because the, the acoustic guitar plays quite a, a key part in it. Now. Well, I just I, I, the, there was a lot of. I came in. There was a session in Paris, uh, just outside of Paris, where um, I came in and played some acoustic guitar on that, and then it was just a case of like coming in and playing. It's a way that if it fits, it will be kept. So if it does, it's immediate. You can tell. You know, you'll plug in and you'll have the track is playing. And for me, I'll play the guitar and. If it sits in there and it all sounds right, nine times out of ten, it will be kept. So a, but also there's a particular thing that both Nick and Warren are looking for. Which is? Um, you have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> What's your interpretation? I think it's a case of if it sits in there, you can tell as soon as you play something and it sounds like it's, it jars, it's not right. It's just, it's just, you can tell straight away. And there's so much space, and that's what's so beautiful. There's a certain quality about the music, and you mustn't crowd it out or thicken it up with loads of guitars if it's not necessary. I think that's the thing, it's to play what is necessary. And the most important thing is that, you know, it, the song connects. And that's one of the things with Nick, is the lyrics he writes. He's such an amazing writer that... Um, and also the way in which she actually connects with you. If you listen to the songs, you know, through you know CDs or live, he's got a, he's got an amazing thing going on. You kind of touched upon it there, but what what is the thing that a musician, if they worked with Nick, would learn that they wouldn't learn from working with anyone else? He's absolutely focused, and he's an incredible, incredible. With my voice. He's, he's incredibly creative, and he's and he works really hard. But he's also an amazing performer, and he is absolutely, totally committed to what he does. I don't think I've ever worked with anybody with that kind of energy. 
He's got an incredible spirit and and so he's, he's got such an energy and it's really inspiring. Okay, so you played on two uh, Nick Cave records, Push a Skyway and, and, and the recent one, uh, Skeleton Tree. Um, tell us about when you first came in for Push a Skyway and that recording process of that album and, and perhaps how that compared um, to Skeleton Tree. I played on the Lawless soundtrack. I played guitar on the soundtrack with Nick and Warren. And f after that, about a year afterwards, um, Nick said that the Bad Seeds were going to make a new record and would I be interested in playing some guitar and I was like wow you know that's great I'd love to do that and I went down to Brighton and I was expecting it to be similar to the sort of I knew it wasn't a Nick Cave Warren Ellis soundtrack score thing I knew it was more about the bad seeds but I was expecting in a way I thought it would be a similar kind of experience and uh, the session in Brighton there was the songs were just in that early stage, in the development stage, and you yeah. know, in the, it was a creative time. And Nick had sheets and sheets of lyrics in front of him, and Warren was playing, you know, had his loops going, and Nick was playing the piano, and so it was a very, and there was Barry Adamson came down and played some bass, mm -hmm. and the actual music that was being recorded, it was very dense. And at the time I remember thinking, God, I've got no space here. There's no space for me to play the guitar. Mm. I tried, but it, you know what I played wasn't really sitting in there. It's one of the things I did learn about the Bad Seeds is if it doesn't sit in there, it won't, it won't work. And that was a big lesson for me when it came to that. And I think it was a period of change where Nick wanted to do something different and it was uh, so Nick and Warren went away and I got the call to go and work in France in I think it was 2012 was it 2012 mm -hmm. and what I heard at those sessions and there was Tommy Tommy was there and Marty was playing bass and what they'd recorded in a week was just incredible. There's so much space there. It was just wide open. And it was nothing like what I'd been involved with back in Brighton. And I played on a couple of tracks, Jubilee Street and Mermaids. Mm -hmm. Played acoustic on the, those songs. And did a few backing vocals. And at one point, you know, we were just going through some songs and seeing whether, you know some more acoustic guitar might have been required and it just wasn't necessary and that was one of the things that even live that if I won't play the guitar rather than try and put something in it's better not to play on the old songs that there weren't guitar parts on well the, the songs that the old songs that the guitar parts are on I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll do the guitar part yeah. but more with the new songs it's a case of like going in there and not playing mm and because it's not necessary there's a beauty in the space there's an amazing thing about the space that's created and just the way in which sonically it works um, so if it's not necessary just don't do it all the ones who come all the ones who go down the The thing with Nick is that he is, you can associate him with your Leonard Cohen's, your Bob Dylan's and, and Bowie and Lou Reed. There's a sort of link from that era of amazing, incredible creative art writers and artists and performers. And Nick is one of those guys and it's, you know, it's, it's, and he's making this new music now that is so creative and forward thinking it's not like he's really, he doesn't 
relax and and make music. You know, he doesn't rest on his laurels, Nick. He's a very forward-thinking person, and um, and there's something about it is like he's a bridge to those amazing artists, and he's very unique. He's such an individual, and there aren't many people like him around anymore. Guy's a legend. He's a yeah, fantastic artist. And what's your kind of most uh, fondest memory of playing with Nick? What's your fondest memory being in the bad seat so far? Uh, there's loads. There, yeah, there are loads, and hopefully there'll be more. You know, it's 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 such a it's it's a privilege to play with them with with the band. They're all amazing musicians, and I think the the just the fact that they they've been going for like you know. 30 years and like you know got this best of record it just represents you know what an incredible artist and what an incredible band they are fantastic music where the um, wild roses grow you don't play that do you very often did it kind of did you at the coco really <laughs> it's a good little venue oh wow yeah 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 she came down for the film if you watch it on on 20,000 days there's a little clip oh right okay yeah and she came down yeah. But never makes the set list for a normal tour. No, I think it's Nick gives you like 40, 50 songs, right? And then he'll, in the tour, he'll say, let's try this one. And you just got to learn it. You go off and learn it. And, and it's like what you said, that thing about timings and signatures and all that kind of That's the thing. It's not, the, the, it's chord wise, quite simple. Yeah. But it's just where it lands and how it supports what Nick does. You know what he sings. On the third day, you took me to the river. You showed me the roses and we kissed. And the last thing I heard was a muttered word. Is he knelt above me with a rock in his fist? On the last day, I took her where the wild roses grow. She lay on the bank. An old beauty was die, and I leant down and planted a rose between her teeth. They call me the wild rose. But the name was the When they call me, I do. Thank you for, for discussing that so, so honestly um, and openly. Um, Bandante. Yeah. Man, there's a big, big tune off your uh, off your new EP that I listen to. Um, uh, um, bang bang, that's the one. What a tune that one is. Um, yeah, in, enjoying that. Is that with um, drama from Kasabian? Is that right? How do you know that? How did you find that one out? Research. It is Ian Matthews. Yeah. Yeah, I did some recordings, and basically, I did 18 songs in three days. I just wanted. I was actually writing for somebody had asked me to do put some songs for some kind of film idea and it wasn't like a film theme or it wasn't like you know it was just some songs that might be used in a in a tv series and so i did i went in the studio and i recorded 18 songs in three days and some of them worked and some of them didn't and the one that really really just jumped out was bang bang and the great thing about that recording was we tried it at the start of the session day one first song and it, it was all right you know but something wasn't there and we recorded all these songs and then right at the end of the session about two o'clock in the morning on the final day on the, the last night three o'clock two three o'clock in the morning i said come on let's just do that song one more time and we went in there and just hit it hard and it just really worked and then we uh I said come on let's just do it one more time played it one more time and it was just unbelievable and it was just really going. It's like, that's it, we've got it. And finished, and we had to stop recording. It's like, that's it, it was, you know, over. And the engineer forgot, didn't, didn't have some mics up. So there was a bit of spanner work that had to go in, in the mix afterwards, which is tough. I've got to say, I mean, if we can sweat, fucking ages. Really? Which is such a pain because if we could have captured what had happened, I was trying, that's the whole thing, when you get into mixing songs, that becomes another thing completely. And there was such a vibe on it that night that for me, it's like if we'd got that one, 
Oof. But man, the, the, the vibe on that tune though is so like so much energy. It's yeah. such a banging tune. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's just it's it's a great guitar riff. It is. Yes. Yeah. You're right. It, there it, I say it. I mean, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but it's 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 just, it's just one of those songs that is kind of it's you know it's it's kind of it's a song about you know just people getting together and. And it's influenced by these kind of... To me, I've got this kind of image of the Warhol factory, kind of, all those films that Warhol did, those kind of, I yeah. know, like, all those Warhol films. And, and also, there's a bit of... You know, the chorus, for some reason, it just... I was thinking about Joy Division. Really? <laughs> dance, dance, dance. Yeah, dance, yeah, yeah. Dance yeah. yeah, so there's that in it. It doesn't sound like that, but it's amazing what comes out. And it's just one of those things that you just, I just did on the spot. No two gigs are the same. Mm. They aren't. How? Well, how do you ensure it's been, that? It's been a, it's been a funny, it's been a, a, a difficult birth, let's say, with Bandante, because I've gone through so many different musicians, and then I actually got the band together in 2015, and 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 we did two gigs, and then you know. The guys that were playing then just to add, it wasn't working. They didn't want to do it. So we've got Sam who's playing the drums and Kai who's playing the bass in now. And there's more of a... It feels more like a band. Although it's my, you know, they're my songs and it's a vehicle for me to express my sort of songwriting and playing and, you know, being, you know, the front person of a band. But it's just something, it's actually a bit of an old school band, really. It's kind of got that old school thing about it where it's more about songs. And, you know, we do stretch solos out and we sort of like just, you know, improvise a bit. So that's where the no two gigs come. Yeah, yeah totally. You, you talk about how great a uh, guitar riff that is. And um, I know you're self taught guitarist, you never have any lessons. Um, what bad habits do you have <laughs> that you would advise a young guitarist not to do? Um, Oh, it's, you know, loads. Is there really? Oh, right. Just, there's loads. Um, I think it's important to, I, I didn't know, I didn't know what an F sharp was until I was about 25. So it was all year. And, and I remember working with somebody and they said, go to F sharp and then go to a A flat minor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You know, so what were spot, you playing? What were, I mean, if there I was could hear it. I could hear it. Oh, I could okay, hear right, yeah. But if you actually said to me, I knew the, the basics. I knew an A minor, I knew yeah. an A major. But anything that had any sevenths in there or anything like that, I remember that night going back and getting a guitar book. I think I got the, you know, somewhere I picked up an old guitar, you know, like teach yourself guitar, and went through that to sort of go, oh God, this is what I need to know. So I think that's the thing, is to really know what the chords are, that's a bad habit. And also, um, the rest, no, I think you've got to develop your own style. Mm. Actually, that's the only thing, is just know what the chords are, know what the notes are. And then the rest is down to your, that's what gives people, makes it interesting, is you don't have to be an amazing virtuoso, it can be really boring. That's the side, you know, you can, one of my favourite songs was like, 
it was public image I, and, and the guitar playing on that song mm. is incredible yeah and it's simple but it's just the feel and the sound it's just something else so you know if you listen to those listen to like Velvet Underground listen to Lou Reed's guitar playing it's the way he plays it mm. it's unique it's his own thing and I think that's more important than being an incredibly like flash guitar player great advice um Career highlights. You don't strike me as someone who sits there going, oh, this was a highlight of my career, but what are the things you're proudest of? Um, I'm very proud of getting the Bandante thing together because it's just something I've always wanted to, to do. And it's early days, but, you know, just to get a single out and just to do that and actually do your own thing is great. But I have to say, um, playing with Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, it's, 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 it really is. It's... It's a privilege. It certainly comes across that way. Um, tour impressions we don't see. I know you kind of touched upon it um, at, the, at the beginning. Um, I've got a quote here from, from your wife, actually, from an article she did, where she actually said there are many times when I wish she had a normal nine-to-five job. Um, does it ever feel like a job to you? Never. 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 Because I know what it's like to have a job, and I know what it's like to be in, you know, where I came from, Stoke. It was a working-class town. And I saw me folks work, you know, in factories and stuff like that. And it was almost like, you know, if there's a way of avoiding that, by hook or by crook, I was going to do it. So playing music and being a musician and, you know, actually make, being able to actually make a life and make a living, it's just, it's, it's just very lucky. I appreciate that. What fears do you have for the music industry and how might they be addressed? It's a, it's a question we ask to every guest, and I think it's interesting to get different perspectives. So, do you have any specific fears for music industry? I think there's two sides to it. I think it's been. I think there is a side with the internet where people can make music and actually have the freedom to make the music. It's just they have, you need the machine more so now, but the machine's become very kind of tightened up. It won't really sort of invest in new artists and like give people a chance anymore. So, um, how does that compare to in the seventies and eighties? It was totally different. Totally different. Totally different because back, you know, back back in the day, bands were given a chance to make like two or three records. Now you've got you, you're lucky if you can make an album. Or you're lucky if you can make it, you know, a, you know, a single. Yeah. But um, I said the thing is not to aspire to be part of that machine. It's when that machine. It's if you can actually do your thing and then get it out there and the machine recognises that and allows you some kind of freedom creatively and to do your thing. But I think you have to do it first yourself. Good advice. Um, what specific advice would you give to a young guitarist? Play. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot. All the time. Play all the time. Okay. Um, we hear stories of how there's not much money left in the music industry. You may or may not agree with that. But how would you approach it if you were a 17-year-old now um, compared to when you were a 17-year-old? I think the same way. I think the thing is, it's, it's always been the same way, really. It's pointless looking at it as a, sort of a, as, as a money-making objective. You're doing it because you want to do it. And if you make money, if people like it, then they will buy it. And they will, you know, there'll be a demand for it. I think that's the, you know so is to do it because you want to do it and not look, you know and not look at it as a, a sort of in any other way. In thirty years' time, how will you reflect on this specific period of your career? Uh, God, you know, I hope I'm around. <laughs> this is the best time. It's amazing. I'm going to be fifty this year, and to think that you know it's been a long, you know, it's that thing. It's it's it's. You know, it's been a long process. Yeah. It didn't happen instantly. And I still don't take any of it for granted because you don't know what can happen. So, um, but this for me has just been an amazing period. Uh, it's the best right now for me. It's the best time. It's a great lesson there that it's taken that long and that much hard work to get to that stage. Yeah. Isn't it? There's not necessarily any shortcuts for that. Um, what's... What ambitions do you still have left? Um, I'd love to make an album with Bandante. I'd love to do that. Play some more gigs. 
on that side of things. Um, you know, let's see. With with the bad seeds, there's the tour in in um, in the summer and in in the autumn. Um, I'd love to be part of that. I hope that continues. Um, and and just to be healthy and appreciate what the you know what life has to offer. Thank you for your insight. Thanks for your wisdom and guidance. Um, keep up the great work with uh, The Bad Seeds. Get that Bandante album recorded uh, and we'll maybe touch base with you in the future once uh, that album has come out. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. For more episodes featuring uh, the likes of Stone Roses guitarist Aziz Ibrahim, um, Oasis keyboardist Mike Rowe, Billy Burnett from Fleetwood Mac, Jennifer Batten on working with Michael Jackson and many more. Go to thestageleftpodcast.com, follow us on Twitter at The Stage Left Pod, like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Stage Left Podcast and go to our Instagram page as well. See you next time.